Um, for those who don't know, um, Leah Leibowitz is a member of our larger community um, and um, writer for Tablet Magazine. He's the host, of, a co-host of Unorthodox, not the Netflix show, but the no. podcast. Um, he is now doing a podcast on Daily Daf, The Daily Daf, which of course connects to me deeply as I, me and Jeremy created one of those seven and a half years ago. Um, and now, as he mentioned before we started, another podcast called Hebrew School, uh, which is just what all of our student kids need as uh, during this during this COVID is they really looking for more Hebrew School, um, but it's a fun <laughs> show. Um, he, but in our family, he's really only known as 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 Lily's father, uh, as he is a uh, he is with my son in he she and he uh are in school together so we're glad in my to family you. too and in my your family too you're only known as lily's father it's perfect um and then i think the most exciting thing about him is truly that he has a phd in video games and i think we're not going to talk about stanley at all um but really just talk about how does one get one of those and what does that mean um because well that sounds really cool <laughs> um, according to, according to, uh, to Leo's book on page 117, um, Stan Lee had a routine when he would do the, the circuit of, of, uh, of, of comic conventions where he would talk for about 20 minutes about the inner workings of Marvel. And then he would do a Q and A and really open it up to the people who were there to talk. And I hope that that's what we'll do today as well. Yeah, um, we'll really have an opportunity. So I've, you know, have questions? some questions and some issues that, that, that we want to talk about, but we really want to make it an open conversation um, and hear what you guys are thinking about, um, both about the book, um, which just came out, um, Stan Lee, A Life in Comics, as well as, um, as well as, uh, as well as general comics and nerdum. Um, again, I'm going to ask people to kind of mute themselves unless they have a question, or at least be aware of the the, the conversation, um, the conversation that's going on, so that we don't interrupt. When when noises come through, um, you take over the screen as well um, until we, of course, highlight uh, Liel. Uh, Liel, thank you for being here. My absolute pleasure. Um, as I was reading through Stan Lee, A Life in Comics, I kind of was trying to figure out whether it truly was a biography or not. And I wondered whether you could talk to what you were trying to write in this book. I mean, it, sh it should be in full disclosure, my wife's uncle also just published a biography of Stan Lee, mm -hmm. uh, Danny Fingeroth, a, a, uh, a Marvel editor for many years. So I've now read two Stanley biographies in the last month. Um, and, and yours did not feel in the same way as a biography. And I wondered what your intentions were when you were writing the book. You're 100% correct. So first of all, uh, Danny uh, is a, a comic yeah, industry genius okay? and veteran and uh, yeah, someone who I have the greatest amount yeah. of respect for. Um, I, I have an issue another, like, with biography. Hold on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute people and then unmute Thank you, Leo. You. Okay. Go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> Zoom, Zoom is a, is a, is a tough, uh, tough art to, to master. So um, the truth is that I'm, I'm pretty bored by biographies because at some point, if you read enough of them and if you attempt to write enough of them, this is now my, my about third uh, biography that, that I write, you kind of find that the details of individuals' lives sort of intersect uh, into this kind of big cocoon of similarities. You kind of find patterns that uh, kind of fit across people's or creative artists' lives. And, and it becomes this kind of like uninteresting mush of uh, basically just going through the motions of like, and this thing that happened to Stanley in his childhood had a great impact on his later career. I don't really care so much for that, uh, in large part because it seems to me to all revolve around this attempt at psychologizing individuals 
that you don't necessarily have direct uh, access to or the ability to kind of sit and, and, and interview at depth. What, what I really think is more valuable is an attempt uh, to do a very deep read uh, of the work and try to ascertain how did this specific thing become so incredibly meaningful, become not just a part of the culture, but really the culture almost in its entirety, the kind of the main uh, thrust of, of what we do when we go to the movies and play video games and, and buy comic books. Uh, and the question then becomes, what, are, what is in its DNA? Please. large swath of Americans. Uh, that to me is a much more interesting question. And the answer uh, that suggested itself before I even began working on the project was that there is something inherently um, biblical about Stanley's work and, and at a deeper level, something inherently Jewish. And that's what I wanted to explore. And that's really what the book is about. Right. When, when I was discussing um, with, with, my boys tonight that I was having a conversation with you and, and I was saying, well, what was it about? And, 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 and they said, you know, I said, well, you know, Liel has this take that, that it's like, that they're all religious characters, you know? And we, I think we should go kind of go, we can go through some of the, the characters you mentioned and, and the religious components that you saw. That, and I'd love to hear you kind of delve deeper in it, but it's so interesting, um, you know, that, that, that you kind of, went through that um you know you, you talked about the thing right and 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 how he was the golem right uh, i was wondering if you want to do you want to kind of go go through that a little bit or i would love nothing more but before i even do that i, yeah. I want to kind of begin at the beginning so Please. the whole the whole comic book industry uh is all created by jews mainly for the for the very good reason is that none of these cats could get work anywhere else you know the serious advertising agencies, not to mention art galleries, would never hire these sons and daughters of, of recently arrived uh, immigrants. And so they go to the place, which is you know cheap, fast, and out of control. It's comic book industry. And the first generation creates superheroes, uh, the first ever superheroes, that are basically just retellings of Christian narratives that already exist and already kind of dominate American society. On the one hand, uh, you have uh, alien Christ, you have Superman, who is a man who dies for our sins uh, in every here he is, in, in every issue anew, uh, who swoops in, saves the girl, is infallible, uh, gives us his good grace, and is not a very interesting character because, well, he's, you know, Jesus from outer space. Uh, he represents this kind of thread of fundamentalism in American society. Uh, that you could see, you know, anywhere from, you know, tent revivals to contemporary, you know, evangelical Christians. On the other hand, uh, you have the embodiment of another Protestant idea that you don't need any superpowers. You just need a good old Protestant work ethic and technology, this kind of high modernist Protestant idea, which is embodied in Batman. Uh, these are two very Christian ideas. Basically, you're looking at the two sides fighting the Scopes monkey trial, right? You're looking at fundamentalist religion versus modernist science. It's a completely Protestant clash, and it's Jews giving Christian readers what they want, which is why these characters were never very interesting to me. But even more so, they were never very interesting to Stan Lee, who wasn't a big comic book fan growing up. What he wanted to do was explore something completely different. He wanted to explore the voices and the themes and, and the emotional valence uh, that he absorbed growing up in a very Jewish community. He wanted neurotic people who argued all the time. I mean, you read the first uh, issue of the Fantastic Four, it's like being at your family's Seder. You know, these are people that despite all their powers are constantly quibbling and constantly kind of trying to one-up each other and clearly love each other very deeply, but clearly disagree on just about everything. And the hardest part for them is to work together. Uh, and it's, it's like this really charming really theologically different way to look at the world. And once he has that in mind, I think he starts arranging his own universe, the whole Marvel universe, based on um, these deep biblical archetypes. You know, so for example, when I read Spider-Man, I think to myself, hmm, here's a story of a person uh, who has great power and then does something terrible, does, fails to stop a murder, which ends up uh, killing, I'm not spoiling anything here, I hope, his own uncle. Uh, and then basically here's the call 
uh, of, of God saying to him, you know, you are your brother's keeper, right? Here's the kind of moral obligation to go out there and use his powers for the good. He's basically a Cain figure. Uh, you know, the thing here is, is, a, is a reincarnation of the Golem story that we have uh, kind of had from at least the 17th century of a creature with great power who is a protector of the community who must then also kind of suffer the, the uh, being ostracized because he's this misshapen creature. M my favorite and most intricate uh, expression of this, uh, and then I promise I'll, I'll shut up about it because I literally wrote a book about it and I could go all night, uh, is, is the That's why we invited you, so it's uh, all good. Well, well, hallelujah to that. Uh, is a juxtaposition of Bruce Banner and the Incredible Hulk, right? Um, this is my favorite story, I think, in the book, because if you read the Rashid, right, if you read Genesis, you have two accounts of creation. Chapter one and chapter two both tell the story of how mankind came to be, and they're radically different stories. In the first story, mankind is created sort of out of thin air. Uh, man and, and, and woman are created together, and man is told, go out there, and in, inhabit the world, conquer the world, you know, name only and like be the kind of the creature that controls everything around you. And then for no apparent reason and without explanation, the story is retold in Genesis chapter two. And all of a sudden man is created out of dirt. Uh, woman is created out of man's rib. And the mission here isn't to conquer, but to conserve, to protect, to take care of the animals, to take care of the planet, to be the sort of like ecological minded, you know, environmentalist. And so to me, that tension, and, and I'm, I'm basing here, of course, on, on Rav uh, Soloveitchik's famous book, The Lonely Man of Faith. To me, that tension is exactly the tension that's interesting between Bruce Banner and the Incredible Hulk, between the scientist who thinks he could literally take over God and create new material from nothing, and, and this beast who sees himself as a protector of all living creatures. These are deeply, deeply theological issues. And they're so interesting because throughout his life, Stan Lee denied repeatedly lying to people like me that he had any you know, uh, religious uh, kind of theological implications when he did this work. So my goal was really to unearth and, and, and expose and explore uh, what he would never, like no good artist should, speak about directly. Well, that's, that's really interesting is because I actually had that question is whether you think this was intentional. I mean, I think that it's so easy to see the, you know, the either the Jesus or the Moses allegory of Superman mm -hmm. and, and the, you know, and, and however, the Cain allegory, I didn't read until I read your book. I hadn't read into it until I read your book, until I read that chapter of your book. And I really, you know, and again, have re having been a you know a nerd my entire life, I had followed Stanley and I had you know again read some other uh, biographies and stuff about him. It really did not seem, you know, and it's not just Stan. It's 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 you know the the, the creators of Batman and Superman. They they were all Jews, as you said. But do you really think that it was intentional, or do you think this is our reading? So I um, was. Very, I was tormented by this question. You know, that's the question that kept me up at night, quite literally, as I was working on this book. I mean, there were there were days when I started working and said, "Man, you just you're just making this stuff up. Like you're just you're just reading your own religious fantasies because you're this you know observant Jew who davens three times a day, and to you everything looks like chakras, right? Like for you everything is exactly everything is like this fantastic mix of of religion, uh, you know, writ large." Uh, but first of all, I think there's still value, uh, as, as there is to all great art, to offer this kind of like new and, and uh, unexpected, unorthodox ways of, of reading the text. But I want to offer something much more. Hashtag concrete. unorthodox, right? A hashtag unorthodox, a hashtag not the Netflix show. Um, and so I want to offer something more concrete, which is a kind of smoking gun. So here I am, I'm researching Stanley's life. Stanley's life is a very well trodden path. He's he himself had published, by my, my count, uh, four <laughs> autobiographies. Uh, the amazing thing about them is that, you know, Stanley was someone who was given to what my other hero, uh, the film director, Werner Herzog, likes to call the ecstatic truth. So when you read Stanley's four autobiographies, none of the facts line up 
like you would tell me exactly the same thing and like there'll be different stories you'd be like man but like two years ago you wrote another book that said the opposite but but then there's one moment in his career that struck me as really transcendent and and kind of the smoking gun or the key to it all so he got into into comics very early uh basically because he needed a job he worked in comics for 20 years he hated it it seemed to him like the worst industry in the world he was con constantly complaining about the schlock that he had to write trying to write serious novels uh he didn't start creating what we know as the marvel universe until he was in his early 40s uh, mainly because he wanted to quit and his very clever wife said, well, if you're going to quit anyway, you may as well do one comic book the way you would like to do it. And it turned out to be the Fantastic Four here before us on the screen. Um, but then in the course of the next 10 years of his life, he had this amazing success. I'm talking here roughly about the years between 1961 and 1971, in the course of which he creates, um, you know, one after the other, the not in chronological order here, but the Fantastic Four, the Avengers, Thor, Spider Man, the Incredible Hulk, uh, the Black Panther, like literally every Doctor Strange, every Iron Man, every superhero that we know in the course of these nine years. And so finally, he's made editor in chief of his company. He's finally the boss. He's finally, you know, in, in the big uh, chair. He could relax. He could start working. And, and Marvel Comics says, okay, well, to celebrate you, we're going to throw a night. We're, we're going to rent out uh, Carnegie Hall and we're going to do a big event for you. And by the way, you get 15 minutes at the end of this event and you can do whatever you want. Fill it with whatever content you want. And here's what Stanley does. Stanley gets in front of this massive audience after an evening filled with literally circus freaks and acrobats and entertainers and poets and anything else. He gets up on stage with his wife and his daughter by his side. And he reads a 15 minute long poem that he had uh, written for the occasion and which I haven't seen reprinted in any book, certainly not mentioned in any of his autobiographies. And this, the poem is called God Cried. And it's this deeply theological exploration of God looking down at his creations and feeling heartbroken by how violent and unkind they are to each other and how deeply racist and, and, and warlike they are at that particular moment in time. And to me that he had such a big stage and took such a detour from his usual, you know, pardon my word, bullshit routine of just talking about himself and, and furthering his, his own myth uh, is really all the proof you need that this was a man of the deepest theological mindset who really was cleverly protecting himself by protesting too much and saying, no, no, this is, this is not uh, about God or the Torah or anything like that, but really cared so deeply about it. That's what I like to assume. That having been said, I think if, if he was uh, around for long enough to actually read this book, probably get a good chuckle out of some of the uh, in inferences that I made. Right. I mean, excuse me, they, they always say that, you know, he never used his, Stan Lieber. He was waiting to write the great novel that he was finally going to use his real name. And I think that poem was really his one attempt. He was, you know on the stage of, of, of Carnegie Hall, and he was gonna use, you know, that was as close as he was gonna get to the great American novel. Absolutely. Right. That was him being the poet. Right, exactly. So it wasn't at all, it wasn't, a, it was, right, exactly. Exactly. Um, so, first of all, I wanna, I wanna continue to, to go through some of this, um, but I was wondering what, in terms of your book, one of the things that many of the biographies and many of the stories, and maybe now more so than, than when he was alive or, or you know, um, is, and you did not focus on, I wondered what you had, whether you had some stories or had some reasoning, um, you do not focus much, you don't not reference it, but you don't mention it much, um, kind of the, the, the Kirby and Ditko versus Stanley divide. Um, and, and I think that, that, that for those who don't know, Stan Lee co-created many of those characters that Liel just mentioned with two artists, um, uh, Jack Kirby, not Bruno Kirby, um, Jack Kirby <laughs> and Steve Ditko. And both of them seem to hate him or by the time they were kind of going through the end of his life um, because they feel like he stole their, their uh, you know, the, if, if you want to go biblical, right? You know, it, it was it was the birthright, right? Adom <laughs> Adom <laughs> Hazet was exactly not worth it. Exactly right. So so um, 
Steve Ditko is, is its own um, story. Steve Ditko is an amazing and fantastically flawed human being. Uh, he was a co-creator of Spider-Man. Uh, he is really one of the strangest people who uh, I think ever lived. He was engaged with Spider-Man for about two years, after which uh, he became a recluse and did not leave his house until he died pretty recently. So he was basically in a 50-year sheltering in place voluntarily in his midtown apartment uh, and was by all accounts this kind of like creative genius is very troubled jack kirby is a very different story i i can't say this enough and i get great pleasure from it and, and if you're not familiar with with his work honestly uh, just look him up online i i believe very firmly that uh, jack kirby was one of probably the greatest american artists of the 20th century if not the greatest visual artist of them to see his work to see what this man could achieve in, in, in a canvas that's this big, uh, the amount of, of, of expression, the amount of energy, the amount of tension, the amount of crackling joy and, and mystery uh, is, is absolutely astonishing. But um, Lee and Kirby were two different uh, Jewish paradigms, right? Kirby grew up in um, the Lower East Side. Uh, his parents were dirt poor. He worked uh, very hard, all kinds of, you know, odd jobs growing up. Uh, he was in a street gang, an all Jewish boy street gang, got into a lot of trouble. Uh, and throughout his life, he was this sort of incohate, cigar chomping, small, stocky kind of Edward G. Robinson type of guy uh, who only had one channel of expressing his emotion, which was comic books. Stan, on the other hand, was born um, to a kind of middle class family that lost everything during the Great Depression, but still. He had enough of a taste of, of its values. He grew up reading Shakespeare and Mark Twain and sort of believed that the way out uh, was through talking pretty, uh, through kind of climbing the corporate ladder, uh, two very different kind of archetypes of, of, of ways to deal with the fact that you're basically the sons of, you know, first generation, you're first generation Americans, the son of, of hardworking, hard pressed immigrants. And this animosity between them uh, really channeled uh, their, their creative relationship, uh, really created a sort of a frenemy type situation that inspired both of them. Again, their collaboration was very, very brief. I, I commented it a little bit. What I didn't want to do is turn this into a kind of, uh, you know, soap opera of, you know, all the indignancies that they, they have inflicted on one another. What I did want to do is look at this tension, again, as, 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 a, as a kind of fundamentally Jewish value because it looked to me like there was something right out of the Zugot, right? Right out, right out of this Talmudic principle of always pairing two cantankerous rabbis who kind of dislike each other and disagree on another, on, uh, with one another and everything, but respect one another tremendously and therefore create this, this great creative tension, which I do think their relationship was all about. Right. Right. There's a question from, from uh, Stephen Wallach who said, Liel, how did the book come to be? Did you pitch your Stan Lee book to Yale, Yale Jewish Lives or did Yale ask you to write the Stan Lee book? You know, so every now and then uh, for your sins, you, life throws you some really great bone. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, the great David Mickix, who writes a tablet and is really one of the most wonderful smart writers, he has a book coming out next year in the same series. Um, which is a biography of, uh, of Stanley Kubrick. And he sort of asked me like, oh, you know, they asked me to ask you like, do you want to do a book with them? I kind of thought like, hey, it's always a, a, an honor to be asked. Sure, let's, let's go, you know, I'll, I'll, let's go to lunch. And so I went to lunch with Eileen Smith, who's the amazing editor who runs the series. And we sit at this Lebanese restaurant. And he says, so we were thinking about Stan Lee. And I said, not really understanding what is happening. I said, well, I've been thinking about Stan Lee since I was seven years old, lady. Like, that's what I do for about two hours of my day every day. She's like, great. So we kind of wanted to write this book. And I sort of looked at her, I think, for like a good two minutes being like, wait a minute. You will give me money <laughs> to spend two years reading comic books and then writing about them? This is about as good as it gets. The one thing that I told her right off the bat and to her immense credit, uh, she kind of dug. It's, look, I, I don't just as I said earlier tonight, I don't like biographies. I'm, I'm kind, of, kind of a little bit bored by them. They also seem kind of a little bit um, too voyeuristic to me. What I really want to write is about the work. I want to write about the characters. I want to explore 
why these characters mean so much and why, you know, 50 years after they were created, they're, they're, they're omnipresent. They're, they're the whole base of our culture. I think there's something deeper there, and I kind of want to go biblical. And, you know, to my great joy, by, by the second martini, she said, go with God. And here we are. This is a, a, a the next question I'm actually going to ask um, the person who asked it. I'm going to unmute them and ask them to ask it. Uh, Mark, you had a, a great question that I can't ask because um, because it is it's too uh, Anshe Chesed centric. Uh, let me see if I can unmute. <laughs> are you uh, Mark? Are you there still? Mark. Okay. Okay. Go for it. Oh, I love your background. Thank you. It's it's DC, but the distinguished no. competition. Um, so, Liel, I, I bought and read your book. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and uh, you know, Stan Lee was born on West 98th Street and West End Avenue. And what, one of the things I learned from your book is that you wrote that he went to a synagogue and joined a theater group mm -hmm. and uh, was pretty involved in the synagogue until he moved to the Bronx, at least. Um, do you know, was that synagogue Anche Chesed? I don't believe so. I believe it was, this is actually a question that as soon as I saw the sort of address and juxtaposition, I was like, would that be something? Uh, I don't think so. I think it was a synagogue about 30, 20 or 30 blocks uptown to the extent that I could figure out talking to people who, who at least knew him early enough in life to talk about these things. It, it's not a place that exists still, uh, which, which made me kind of sad because I really wanted to get down to it. But again, it's so impossible to tell with him because you know, part of the fun and part of the pleasure, he's a storyteller. And the stories that he tells are not factual <laughs> most of the time. Uh, and they're a wonderful story. And uh, throughout my book, I sort of make these caveats like, you know, reader beware, right? These are not uh, proven or provable. The, the, the most famous example of this, he claimed uh, that when in high school, there was some um, essay writing competition for the New York Herald Tribune, which he had won so frequently making the, the, the modern day equivalent of I think like $3,000 per essay that the newspaper editor had to call him and said, we're barring you from competing because you're just too good and you should get other people a chance to win. Uh, two researchers, God bless them, actually did the work a few years back of looking through the entirety of the archives and corroborating everything. And to the best of their knowledge, uh, Stan Lee submitted his stuff once and came in third. Uh, but what a story. And, and why he, he also it. tells the story of having written on the ceiling of the newspaper room, you know, Stan Lee is God, not to that mention story, the fact that he didn't start using the name Stan Lee until 30 sorry. years later. Although that story, I think, is true. I've spoken to enough people who confirm this that this seems to be something that he had in, in mind. A kind of, you know, cool. I, I heard the opposite that he actually wrote, he did it, but it, he, he wrote Stan Lieber. He wrote Stan Lieber? Oh, okay. So, you know. <laughs> there you have it. It's, it's still a grandeur, right? He still really believes in himself. I mean, here, here's, here's the amazing thing about him, and, and this is one of the propositions that made writing this book so challenging and so difficult. This is, this is a man who invented himself out, out of whole cloth. He was extremely prominent uh, in, in shaping a particular sliver of the culture during a, say, nine and a half year period there in, in the 60s and then lived for, for 40 more years, during which he did almost nothing but be Stan Lee. Uh, you know, it is such a weird thing to be. And yet, when you look at popular culture, there are a bunch of, uh, you know, I think examples of people who had done this. If you look at the Beatles, for example, when you really get into music, you know, your first assumption is, the Beatles were dominant throughout, you know, a period that probably started in the 50s and ended probably in the 90s, right? When you're a kid, this is kind of what your mind works. And then you look at the actual, you know, history and you understand that they're around for about nine and a half years, after which some of them had solo careers, uh, some more successful than others, but it's just kind of one burst of inspiration. And, and what do you do for an encore? Stan Lee's answer was both inspired and tragic because... You talk to the people who knew him best, and even they can't penetrate that shield, which is one more reason to, to sort of uh, equate him and his work and, and focus on the, on the creation rather than the creator. 
I agree. Uh, other people, I want to invite other people to either raise their hand or type in their questions. We're happy to have other questions. It doesn't have to just be a conversation uh, between Liel and I at all. Um, you know, again, as, as, uh, as, as Stan said, he, he really wanted it to be a conversation. Um, and when Liel and I originally discussed having this, he said, oh, well, you know, we'll talk all things geek or all things nerd. I don't remember the exact language you used. Um, you know, so- I'm wearing, I'm wearing my favorite new video game t-shirt. What, what game is that? Untitled Goose Game. It's the greatest game ever. You play a cantankerous goose who terrorizes a small, peaceful English village. It is the most English video game ever created, and it's just wonderful. <laughs> oh, now we're going to have to find it. Um, OK, but so, so you've talked video games. Now, I'm going to ask you, you have to tell us, how does one get a, uh, a, a, a PhD in video games? <laughs> You know, uh, one has to be born a fundamentally unserious human being and then, and then uh, emigrate to a city like New York and figure out very uh, early on that uh, working uh, in, in a kind of a nine to five office environment is something for which one was never cut out uh, to do. And, and then you discover academia, you discover Columbia University, which is this amazing nurturing place that lets you research anything that you want. Uh, and I got, I got my master's in journalism there uh, and then made, I think, a pretty good case, uh, which uh, seemed to me at the time like a complete scam, that video games uh, were a nascent medium, that they were important, that they were certainly making enough money to merit some, some serious uh, attention. And to my <laughs> great surprise, honestly, and to my great joy, the university said, well, okay, welcome to this PhD program. We will now pay you a generous stipend, uh, which you could use to live and play video games and think about them for five years. And again, like with the Stan Lee book, there was a moment in which I said, wait, really? <laughs> this is actually happening right now. Uh, but uh, <laughs> exactly, you know, but, but then but then again, I, I sort of realized how incredibly important uh, this kind of question really was, because this is, as, as, as I could tell from my kids, as I, you know, assume you, you may tell from yours, uh, there is something fundamentally different going on when, when one plays, especially one who is young, plays uh, video games, as opposed to watching TV. It's a completely different cognitive function, uh, which, which does different things for the brain, uh, gears the sort of entire emotional uh, interaction, cognitive uh, kind of alignment in a different way. And so it struck me as, as a kind of important to think about it seriously. And to, again, my great surprise, most of the early scholarship about this thought about it in ways that were really weirdly inadequate because it was basically seen as an extension of TV. Like I would go to some of these early conferences and people would say, video games are this, that, or the other. And, and I would ask them, I'm really sorry to be a jerk, but like, can you code? Because you know these things that you're talking about? You know they're code, right? And the person would say, well, no, but I uh, read a lot of books about them. I said, well, you know, it's like writing a, a guidebook to Switzerland from your home in the Upper West Side. Like you can't actually do that. Uh, well, Penn um, Gillette says that you know that video games are the rock and roll of this generation. Absolutely. Right. And and an amazingly uh, important medium. And and to, to the parents out there, I will say, uh, and to the some children that that I see uh, in on the screen too, uh, they are immensely, immeasurably better for you than watching TV. It's not even in the same category. It's not even, you know, like a bag of potato chips versus a carrot. Uh, they actually have a whole host of, of cognitive advantages. Uh, and if you have the choice between two things to do that involve a screen, you know, turn off the TV, which is genuinely, un you know, categorically, undeniably just terrible for you, and pick up a video game, which gives you, which gives you good stuff. Not for too long, and maybe not every day, but it's kind of good. Even the Arrowverse? Everything. Although not so much the games on your iPhone, which are too mindless. We're talking old school consoles here. Um, so so uh, uh, we have another question, which is, did, did, did uh, Stan really make a cameo in every Marvel movie? And I think talking about that, that transition of, of his into that cameo player, um, that Stan Lee character, I wonder whether he wanted to to, what, what your thoughts on, on that transition was? Well, um, the transition is really interesting in large part because he actually really didn't know 
how to play well on uh, TV and, and uh, movies. He tried a lot. I mean, granted, a lot of it here is timing. But when you also, when you see some of his uh, ideas and some of his pitches for early TV shows, and remember, he spent about 30 years of his life pitching these TV shows and movies, um, the ideas weren't good. And I think in large part, and, and this is immensely to his credit, it's because Stan Lee was a fundamentally, deeply, thoroughly literary guy. I mean, this is really a person who, growing up, hated comic books, read Twain and Shakespeare, and had this kind of great literary aspirations. He didn't really understand TV or movies. He understood writing. He understood storytelling in, in print on the page. And the worlds that he created were actually these really intricate universes that not only melded together with one another, uh, but also had things to say about the real world. Famously, uh, and again, to his immense credit, he was one of the first comic book uh, artists out there who thought it meant a lot to comment on real world issues. Uh, Spider-Man deals with race riots. Uh, Spider-Man deals with the Vietnam War. Iron Man deals with alcoholism and drug abuse. I mean, these are real world issues and no one, right, this is, this is one of the famous and still very kind of weird uh, comic book to read. Um, no one else was doing this. He was doing this and he was commenting as Stan Lee and the editorial page of these comic books about the war, about, you know, uh, race in America uh, in, in, a, in a kind of really profoundly great way because he was basically, you know, risking alienating half of his audience based on, you know, what he was saying in a deeply, much like our own politically contentious time. Uh, but he did this because he felt this was, this was a grander thing. Now, it took about 40 years um, for a person like Kevin Feige, who's the, the current head of, of Marvel Studios, to come aboard and understand, like Stan Lee understood, that if this thing is going to work, A, it had to be its own universe. It can't just be like, well, we'll give you a Spider-Man movie, and then a couple of years later, you'll have the second Spider-Man movie, but rather it all had to be intertwined. And second of all, that it had to be intertwined in our world. And I think in large part, it had to happen in a moment in time, much like Stan Lee's moment in time, which is a moment of American, uh, I'm very careful about my words, I don't want to say decline, but certainly transformation uh, of America changing the way it sees itself from one thing to another thing and, and going through this great big soul searching product. It had to happen then. It could not have happened during the Reagan years or the Carter years or, or any other point in American history. Uh, I, I'm not a, I'm not a uh, zombie enthusiast. However, I, I actually, you're talking about it having to be now. I'm wondering whether you have any take on, on the, the zombie comic book and the, the outbreak co you know, concepts that are in those comic books uh, in reference to where we're at today. Well, yeah, I mean, with, with the zombies, to me, it's, it's less about comic books and it's, it's more about movies. Uh, you know, again, George Romero making his movie for a, a pittance in, in 1962, Night of the Living Dead, in 1968, Night, Night of the Living Dead. Uh, I don't know how many of you watched this movie. Please watch it. And, and if you haven't seen it in a while, please rewatch it. It is shocking. Not because of any of the horror uh, kind of uh, quotient, but because when the film ends, and, and I won't spoil anything, but it ends on a very kind of discordant social note, you find yourself literally kind of, you know, your breath being taken away for a second because you understand how, uh, A, the movie was never about zombies, it was about American society all along, and B, uh, how contemporary this feels, how ripped from the headlines. It, it is a lot about race tension. It's a lot about, you know, lynching and violence against blacks. Like it, it, it could, might as well have been a story that, that we read just the other day. Uh, and so I think all these, you know, as, as Freud uh, so wisely told us about the return of the repressed, all these issues, uh, even as we were not grappling with them for a few decades, behind our backs, they were grappling with us. And when we needed a language to return to them, when we needed our own Iliad, right, or our own Odyssey, uh, we, turned, we turned right here. We turned to Stan Lee, we turned to Marvel Comics, because these are the mythical, this is the epic poetry in, in images of our time. And, and it, it makes the big values uh, that we have lost the capacity to speak about rationally and coolly that much easier to process, because here they are presented to us 
in in you know colorful ways with masks and villains and aliens and it makes the whole conversation that much more inclusive which is why it's so fascinating to me interesting okay i'm gonna uh, unmute scott harris who had a question or maybe invite him to unmute himself okay sure um leo which, which biblical characters were not uh covered and <laughs> and and, 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 and who really deserves the treatment, you know, uh, ah. in, your, in your opinion? Okay, that is an amazing question. Uh, and again, I, I don't know how, how mindful Stan Lee was, uh, was of characters. In the book I do, uh, you know, kind of do analyses of, of the Incredible Hulk uh, as Adam, Spider-Man as Cain, um, the Silver Surfer as Abraham uh, being asked by a wrathful God to leave the planet that he loved and uh, go elsewhere and then having to stand up to that god and, and have a confrontation with him for the sake of, of morality. Uh, but if I had to answer your question, one, one creation that I wish Stan Lee came up with and, and, and had given us, uh, I would say Jonah. I would mm -hmm. say someone who tries to run away from his destiny uh, and understand that you cannot run away, uh, that you must uh, go and interact with other people and deliver this message that no one wants to hear. And that to me resonates so well because another uh, brilliant part of, of Stan Lee's understanding is, is creating this world in which these superheroes are very often despised. I mean, Spider-Man has J. Jonah Jameson, a newspaper editor who makes his entire living out of basically trolling Spider-Man and arguing that Spider-Man is the reason behind all this you know, crime uh, in, in the city because he's only trying to, you know, create this so he could swoop in and, and, and be the hero. I would love a, a Jonah type character coming and saying, you know, well, you guys need to do better. And then the whole city of Nineveh being like, dude, like, who are you? Like, why are you telling us these things? That, that reads to me like a very Stan Lee type of interaction. Abigail, you had a response. Um, yes, it was that, uh, like, I don't really think that the ent the whole Jonah thing would have really worked with the entire American dream that he was trying to promote and that he a and that he actively promoted in like the 1950s and 60s with like Captain America fighting uh the communists. Um I say it sort of because it would be like oh you were born in this certain place that means that you have to like it means that sorry, like your destiny to stay there. I don't think that would have really worked. So who do you pick? Um, I would have picked Deborah, honestly, huh. because she's like this whole advisor, and she goes and she uh, and when the uh male character is scared, I mean he should be scared. He's leading a war, but when the male, the main male character is scared, uh, she goes off and she leads the war. And I she basically love just that. runs from the shadows. Listen, Abigail, I, I don't know what you're doing these next couple of weeks, but if you want to take some time, write and illustrate a comic book, I think that could be a great hit. That's an amazing idea. Deborah, the new Avenger. <laughs> I love it. Um, in, I, I wanted to kind of go to a, a slightly different level is, is in terms of um, that, aside from the biblical characters, a lot of the char a lot of the superhero characters kind of dealt with um, sort of the Jewish themes that are so important to us. Um, on, on my screen, you have the Crisis on Campus uh, Spider-Man episode, um, Spider-Man book. Um, and I wanted to talk about both that one um, as well as kind of what you have, you've said about the, the, the X-Men and Magneto being the, the versions of, of Malcolm X and and Martin Luther King, again, these are kind of fall into a morality tale um, and wondered whether you could expand. Absolutely, so, so I'm, 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 gonna go, I'm gonna go deep and I'm gonna go Talmudic here. Uh, so first of all, I think that before we even can discuss these, uh, these, these characters, uh, I think we need to consider something kind of profound and inherent about the way Stanley saw the world, which is very much aligned with his famous Talmudic tale that, that I take in many on, on the call know about the, uh, the oven of Achanai, right? It's this conversation, a couple of rabbis are sitting and they're having this debate about something and Rabbi Elazar says one thing and everyone else says something else. 
And Rabbi Elazar says, well, if I'm right, uh, let this tree here uh, get up, uh, uproot itself, and do a dance. And the tree does that, and the other rabbis are saying, we're not impressed. This is just a tree. A tree doesn't prove anything in matters of halakha. And Elazar says, okay, well, you know, if I'm right, uh, let the stream over here change the course of its flow. And the stream does that, and the other rabbis say, we're not impressed. It's just a stream. A stream doesn't get any say in matters of halakha. And the conversation goes on and on until Elzar kind of very frustrated says, well, you know, if I'm right, let God himself come and say so. And then a voice comes from the heaven and says, you know, he's right. And the other rabbi says, excuse me, but that might be your opinion up there in heaven, but down here on earth, we get to call the shots. It's our decision to make. Uh, and the story concludes with the prophet Elijah uh, meeting one of the rabbis a few uh, days later. And the rabbi asking, well, you know, how did God take to this bit of insolence? And Elijah says, well, he says uh, he loved it. And he said, I have met my children and they have bested me. Uh, which is to me this like profoundly Jewish notion of, of moral justice and moral responsibility being not some kind of ephemeral, ethereal, abstract idea that exists in some realm that is not for us, but rather a very pressing responsibility that is up for us here, up to us here to decide on earth. I think that was Stan Lee's kind of like uh, motivation. And, and again, consider how radically different that is from say Superman. Uh, and that led him uh, to, to this real engagement in trying to figure out where he stood on, on all these issues. Uh, the X-Men is the most astonishingly interesting example. If some of you are bored tonight, and if you have access to Disney+, Plus, which as a nerd, I tell you, you should, um, there is a, a, a Saturday morning cartoon version of the X-Men that was created in the 90s that is available in its entirety. It is one of the most kind of like stunningly deep, serious, philosophical, meaningful, socially kind of aware works of popular culture in the last 30 years. And it's all about that, right? Who are the X-Men? They're, they're mutants. They're people who society deems outsiders. You could completely read this as a story of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. What approach do you take to oppression? But then as you continue to read the series and you see what Stan Lee's um, successors did with with the DNA that he and Jack Kirby put in the series. Uh, at some point in the 90s, a, a writer who was writing the X-Men wrote a backstory suggesting that uh, Professor X and Magneto actually met in a hospital, a psychiatric hospital in Haifa, where they were working with Holocaust survivors trying to cure them of, of PTSD. And that Magneto's backstory was actually being a member of the Sonderkommando in Auschwitz. So it gave them this like very deep Holocaust background, which again answers this question that, that many of us ask, you know, where was God in the Holocaust? What do you do uh, with oppression? Uh, what are the dangers of having oppression uh, sort of backfire and, and sort of simmer into, into sort of like vengefulness and abuses of power? These are profound questions. These were the questions that he was really interested in, but the way he was interested in it wasn't some you know, guy kind of swoop in and, and make everything right, but, but these people who are totally fallible because after all, it's not in heaven. It's, it's up to us here to decide what we do. I mean, again, and then in the movies, they, you know, they, they made Magneto, you know, they, they retold that story once again, making him even more sympathetic um, and making it a more Jewish story. St Stanley said throughout his life, you know, he is not an unsympathetic character, he's not a villain. He's, he's a character that, that he's always loved. If, if you want to understand, you know, how different this approach, how radically different this approach is, think again of, of Superman. There's, there's an amazing Superman story. And as far as I'm concerned, really, the only Superman story worth reading uh, is this comic book, again, from, the from I think 2003, called Red Sun. Uh, and, and what Red Sun uh, posits is what had happened if uh, Superman's father waited two more minutes before sending him down to Earth. And because of the uh, Earth's revolution, he does not end up in Kansas in the 1950s, but in some farm in the Ukraine and becomes not you know, the man of steel in America, but rather uh, Joseph Stalin's greatest kind of uh, you know, war machine and therefore the leader of the Soviet Union. Uh, and the reason this story is so interesting to me is because it suggests 
what is so fundamentally, I think, absurd about Superman. He's, he's a daus, uh, he's a daus et smechina, right? He's a, he's a god who comes out of the machine, and, and we humans have no way of dealing with him because it's literally look at him. I mean, there's nothing we can do to him. Stanley's characters don't live in this universe. You know, they have yeah. drinking problems. They have family problems. They're poor. They come from Queens. They like the Mets. I mean, they're really saddled with every misfortune a human being can be saddled with. Right. Wasn't there a piece where at some point they decided that, that Superman could never fit, face Hitler because it would be unfair of a challenge? So they kind of ignored that reality? Uh, yeah, plus it, it was always from the get. I mean, again, the, the, the Hitler question is so interesting. So when Stan Lee entered Marvel Comics for the very first time, just in the early 40s, um, he was a teenager. He got the job out of sheer nepotism. Uh, his uh, cousin uh, was related to the person who, who started Marvel Comics, and, and he had a, a good job, and you know, Martin Goodman was the person's name, and, and he gave Stan Lee, basically out of pity, some job fetching sandwiches and, and filling ink pots. And he comes there, uh, and he sees two artists, uh, one of whom being Jack Kirby, and they're working on a comic book. And this comic book is Captain America. And on the very first issue, famously, some of you might have seen the cover, Captain America socks Hitler in the face. And the most interesting thing to remember about this in, in when it was released, it wasn't some popular bravado virtue signaling, hey, look at us, we're rah-rah Americans. It was the desperate cry of two, you know, first-generation Americans who had family that was already being rounded up in Europe to get this country to care, to get this nation, you know, alert about the realities of what was happening to Jews in Europe. It, it was this sort of like desperate... And, and wild uh, attempt at making people understand uh, what it was like to face this particular challenge and doing it through this, this hero who is the sort of sublimated um, explosion of, of all our uh, wildest desires and, and frustrations. That is a very different character than, than this here guy, you know? That is a very much more earthly and again, much more Jewish. And the fascinating thing for me is to see this, this vision uh, win, win over, uh, basically to see, to see Marvel's characters, not Superman and not Batman. And it's not just because the studios are run differently or, or you know, have different business strategies, but to see the quote unquote Jewish vision win over and, and become the dominant stream of American culture. That to me is just, it's mind boggling. It's so great and weird. Right, Dorothy, do you want to unmute yourself and share your question? I could try and unmute you, or there you go. All right, it's not Dorothy's question, it's her husband's question. Oh, I apologize, I just saw the name. No, it's okay. fine, it's fine. The question, my question is about Daredevil, who's mm -hmm. the most, as far as I can figure out, explicitly religious character in the Marvel Universe. I mean, Ben Graham aside. And I'm wondering, but yet he's Catholic, and his Catholicism is central to his, like, his arc, his story arc as huh. a, character. And so I'm wondering if Stanley ever discussed this or, or how this features into this religious understanding of, of Marvel Comics. You know, this is very interesting. I, I have, I've given it very little thought. I have not seen anything that, that Stanley said about him. I'm actually not even sure what role he played. Do you happen to know, was, was it a Stanley creation or was it something that Stanley had commissioned from other artists? I'm not 100% sure. He's a bit of a later addition, isn't he? He's asking for that. Yeah. Not yes, he's, he's definitely later, but... Right. Um, I don't think Stanley had anything to do with it, to be honest. And, and I don't think... Again, t to me, this is, this is the best I could answer the question. So first of all, no, I didn't, I didn't ever see any, any specific um, addresses. And, and, and I think he did uh, come later. I'll, I'll look at it as soon as we're off the Zoom. I don't want to be rude now, but maybe it's a, a Buscema or one of these great artists that Stanley had empowered. But, but that is actually kind of an amazing uh, insight in, into, the, into the genius of Stan Lee. And, and it comes in two parts. First of all, to kind of answer this question, one word about the Marvel method. So before Stan Lee came, uh, comic books worked almost exactly like uh, garment district uh, businesses worked, right? I mean, it was the same people, Shmata business, comics business, it was the same logic. Uh, and it was, it was sort of a production line logic, right? 
Uh, there's one person cutting, one person measuring, one person sewing, same in comics, one person drawing, one person writing. And they sort of like, they moved down uh, the production line. Stanley uh, invented this thing called the Marvel Method, uh, which, is, which is real genius, in which he would come up with a kernel of a story, which is the vaguest I've seen actually, kind of like uh, handwritten notes of, of some of them. Uh, and, and they were the most vague outline you could imagine, you know. Spider-Man does this and then that happened. It's like almost like your third grader trying to sum up their favorite book. Um, and then he would give it to the artist and the artist would draw basically whatever they wanted loosely based on that principle and then on, on that, on that uh, synopsis. And then Stan Lee would, would swoop in and actually write the text of the dialogue of, of what was being said, which, which gave birth to really immense creations, including, for example, the Silver Surfer, which Stanley never invented. Stanley gave this kind of um, idea about the Fantastic Four uh, fighting this godlike creature named Galactus. And he gets back the proofs from Jack Kirby and he sees this, this dude, <laughs> this silver dude on the surfboard in the sky. And to his immense credit, instead of saying, why are you messing up my story? What is this guy? Uh, he said, oh my God, this guy is amazing. We have to write a whole new part for this guy. This guy is the greatest creation. Uh, and so that method really encouraged artists in real time to come up with their ideas, but it did something else. It also encouraged, and here I'm getting to, to your question, it also encouraged the people who came after him uh, in Marvel to really dig deep into the DNA that he had put down. As I said, the, the, the most classic example uh, is the future generations of X-Men writers who understood from the get-go the sort of religious, racial, ethnic undertones that Stan Lee had put into the, in, into the, into the series and, and went wild exploring them. So I will not be surprised at all uh, digging into it to learn that Daredevil uh, was a Catholic writer's work who came and understood the license that Stan Lee had given uh, future generations of Marvel writers to get really serious with things and, and, go, uh, and go deep. A another example here, um, Darren, you had, you had the thing on before. So The Thing is the star of this great, amazing, soulful comic book from, I believe, the 90s called Remembrance of Thing Past, which any comic book that alludes to Proust and the titles already won me over, in which The Thing goes back to his old neighborhood uh, and he uh, is feeling guilt-ridden because as a, as a youth in a gang, he had stolen a, a high necklace from a pawnbroker and he wants to return it. He feels very guilty because he believes it's Yom Kippur today. He doesn't really know, but he thinks the day he's doing this is Yom Kippur. And he goes to the pawnbroker and the pawnbroker uh, pawn is, is hurt in some explosion and the thing saves his life. And then the pawnbroker says, you're Jewish, aren't you? Like all these years in, in the press, like why didn't you ever say it? And he's like, well, you know, the thing says, and it's kind of like you could almost hear Larry David's voice. Eh, I was too busy. There was a lot going on, you know. And then the pawnbroker ends up giving him the high and says, you know, you're, you're a good kid. You know, never forget where you came from. Never forget your soul. Stanley had nothing to do with that comic book. But Stanley put all the elements into the character, into the story that enabled generations of writers later to come back to these themes. Because I think they understood, much as I understood, that, that this was a major Jewish saga and in some cases Catholic saga. Uh, waiting to be told. Sounds like Mark may have an answer to. Uh, to I would love that to to the Daredevil piece. Do you want to unmute yourself, Mark? He used he used that wonderful thing called the internet. I think. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. While you were talking, and then I was being rude, I guess. Um, no, that's great. Tell us. I looked up. He Daredevil was created in 1964 by Stanley. Um, well, co-created. Excuse me with uh, the artist Bill Everett, who I had, didn't even sound familiar to me. Bill Everett is amazing. Bill Everett is, is one of the original guys who created uh, Submariner and oh. uh, yeah, Human Torch and these guys. He must have been. And, and so that was the, the fact. I mean, and in my opinion of it, uh, I think he became more Catholic when, Bill, when Frank Miller was writing right. him and when he did the great uh, Born Again, of course, which could not, couldn't be a more Catholic title. Uh, that, that, that sounds perfect, perfect. But I'm not, I, I can't say that that's a fact. Well, you can say it, you just might be wrong. <laughs> right. Do others have questions? You can feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question you want to ask Leo. 
or comment. Or comment. It's the most or polite comment. Jewish audience ever. Come on. Mark Paul, who's the president of our congregation, has taught us that we stay muted until we have something to say. <laughs> and Mark is here. Something? Go for yeah. it. Um, okay, so I was, so then earlier I was reading this uh, sort of how Superman came to be. Mm -hmm. um, and apparently they had to get Superman to flunk his test. So uh, they had him get overexcited and read the thing in the other room. Why do you think they had to get him to do that? Um, like, to keep him on the home front, but why would they need to keep him on the home front? Like, what's the explicit purpose? Well, you know, I've, I've never been a very big fan of, of Superman, but, but here's how I read it. Uh, so Superman's created uh, by, by these two kids, uh, Schuster and Siegel, and uh, one of whom is this, I mean, they're both from, from Cleveland, and one of whom uh, hears a knock on the door one evening when he's, I think, 14, and is told by a neighbor that his father, who worked uh, at a clothing store, uh, was just robbed and murdered uh, by some thug, you know, trying, trying to take the till, um, which obviously does tremendous damage to, to the mind of, uh, of a young boy, and you would not be surprised at all to know that in the very first Superman comic book ever created, Superman thwarts a robbery attempt at a clothing store. Uh, this is very much the kind of, you know, uh, uh, omnipotent fantasy uh, of a very hurt, scared boy, uh, which, which brings us back to, to who Superman is and, and what he was designed to do. Uh, I forget I said, Dara, I think, I think it was you, Sending Superman to the front um, to fight World War II would not have been particularly interesting because it would only have, how would I put this gently? It, it would have created a theological reality, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, uh, which was very untenable because if you have a Superman in the universe, Superman technically could end World War II in about two and a half hours, right? Superman could fight the entire Nazi machine and, and, and kill Hitler and, and restore peace to the world. And that would be fantastic. However, that would make the world we live in completely insufferable because it would basically mean that, that you know, all of our free will and, and all of our designs were basically meaningless as we shared this planet with a being who now happens to be uh, benevolent, uh, but could turn at any point and any you know, given moment if he felt that we were not living up to his expectations. That's bad theology. You know, that, that's a bad basis for a religion, uh, which is why you kind of had to keep Superman A half hidden by this ridiculous premise of like, oh, you don't recognize me now that I put on my glasses, right? I'm Clark Kent now because I wear a tie and my hair is part of the side, which is really one of the things that Stan Lee found so insufferable because he felt like, of course, we know who you are. And second of all, if you had superpowers, why wouldn't you want to flaunt them? Like, if I had superpowers, I would want everyone in the world to know that I was awesome and could fly and, you know, take bullets. Um, but, but furthermore, uh, it, it was just this kind of storytelling mechanism that was difficult because Superman had to be uh, reserved to the home front. He had to be reserved to, you know, fighting this ridiculous other character, Lex Luthor. He had to uh, uh, feign all kinds of weaknesses or have weaknesses invented for him. Because in other words, what's, what's the point of living in the world with Superman? Right. Um, I have a question. Um, this is about like Magneto, I guess. But um, I was talking to one of my friends about like how they're, they might, you know, reboot the X-Men and redo that again in the movies. And he was saying that um, they might like take out that backstory of Magneto having been a Holocaust survivor because mm -hmm. they might like think it's not relevant or it didn't like match up with the timeline. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering like what you thought of that and like to what extent you think that that like backstory defines sort of who he is or what his purpose is. Since I know he wasn't created with it, but like, I don't know. I've always thought of it as a pretty important part of his motives. You know, that's a brilliant question, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer 
completely emotionally and and without uh, any kind of you know reservations. So first of all, just by way of context, you're absolutely right. From the very first introduction of Magneto, the 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 the, the, the precise Holocaust stuff came later. But in the very first um, introduction of of him, he uh, speaks to Wanda, uh, who is at this point no uh, not yet his daughter. That was only revealed later, but only some sort of uh, person he's caring for in some way, and says something like, "Remember, in Europe, when they came for you, like it, it was this like very cryptic, bizarre kind of." you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge type of thing that you really have to be basically a Jew to understand what it is that he's talking about. So part of me says like, I don't love the fact that it's being rewritten. However, however, um, I saw Spider-Man Into the Multiverse, um, which if you haven't seen, it's just the most delightful, incredible movie. And, and one thing that movie convinced me uh, was that there was immense joy and even importance in, in, in reinventing these characters every couple of years to fit the most urgent and emergent um, uh, issues that we're talking about. I love the fact that Spider-Man is now, you know, a mixed race kid from Brooklyn living with a very different reality because you know what? There are new problems for these heroes to solve. These heroes cannot be stuck in Ember. They, they have to constantly be regrowing. So to me right now to have like an all black X-Men would be kind of amazing. You know, it would kind of like a, whole new way to think about it and what a great way to to re-engage with the characters and it doesn't diminish in the least the importance or or the grandeur or the meaning of these original creations i mean the original creations are still there uh people who care about this stuff will always go back and read these original stories but what a great opportunity to look at at new and and and, and pressing and interesting problems so you know, I know a lot in the in the comic book community are sort of you know sort of grumpy about it, but I'm I'm just excited with any new thing that happens that sounds like it could be cool. Plus, I mean, look look at anything that happened to comics. It's and again, I totally I totally credit Stanley for it. We have Squirrel Girl now. Do you read Squirrel Girl? Like, what an amazing comic book! Like, a girl who's like part squirrel who like literally is the most powerful person in the universe. Like, that is the kind of of weirdness and and sort of like empowerment that comes directly from from Stanley's you know emotional and intellectual heritage, and and I want a million more of those, please. Do other folks have some questions? Anyone should just feel free to unmute themselves. Mark. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry to ask another question, but Leo, did you catch in into the multiverse that uh, they made one of the Spider Men? Uh, the dad bought Spider-Man Jewish. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> and the only, only way I, I can't quite have the, the um, when he stepped on a glass mm -hmm. at his wedding. Yeah. I, I was uh, probably one of one of three middle-aged Jewish men in the theaters snickering. Yeah, like, look at that. <laughs> one of there. us. I was I another one. Is, yes. One this of is us. the funny thing because they're so. I mean, you read these things and like. They're so clearly old Jews. I mean, you look at the Fantastic Four, be like, God, like it's literally you're like your Uncle Ira, right? Like they're all cantankerous, kind of you know trying to one up one another, have like quibbles with things, are constantly unhappy yet incredibly sweet, incredibly loyal, incredibly tethered to this idea that theirs is somehow both a faith and a family. Like it just it's impossible to me to read. I mean, the weirdest is actually impossible to me to read it without this deeply Jewish uh, background. I don't even know how people who haven't grown up the same way I and, and I assume many of us on, on this call grown up uh, could actually access uh, a lot of this stuff, which is again, another reason why, why I love the fact that it has now become, it's like bagels, right? When the best bagels in the world, and, and this is maybe a hot take, but I, I totally agree or believe in that, uh, are absolute bagels on 107. Now, when they're made by Thai immigrants, forget that Jewish food. Like this is now our gift to the world. It's now the world's to reinterpret and recreate in whatever way they see fit. However, if you ever go to the Wikipedia page of Jewish superheroes, it's a sad list. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, it's the thing and then you got nothing really that you're proud of. Uh, yeah, oh there's um, Harley Quinn, which I think now that she's popular, they're trying to erase it, but she, um, is definitely ethnically half Jewish. Huh. 
And then there's Batwoman. Um, this is like DC, but in I know in one of the more recent runs, they were like, yeah, she's Jewish and a lesbian now, and mm-hmm. she can both, you know, be a lesbian and like women and be of the Jewish faith. And that really resonated with me. So yeah. I thought that was really cool. But yeah, it is a pretty sad list. It's, it's very cool. Although I will say the new Harley Quinn show, uh, which I'm having very conflicted emotions about, yeah. uh, in one of the first uh, episodes of the first season, she, um, she busts, I forget who, I think the Riddler's son's bar mitzvah. It's the Penguin's, I think. The Penguin's son bar mitzvah, right? And like everyone there is literally fat hook nose and holding yeah. literal holding bags, bags of money, of money. right and it's just a, like i looked at this thing i was like guys we have come a long way but let's let's not get ahead of ourselves wasn't there the, that that scene in the peng in in the batman in the in batman of the penguin's dad of of, of right. you know, herman throwing the penguin <laughs> into the river uh yeah that's that's a lot to take but again, there's so much amazing stuff uh, out there right now to kind of read and, and watch and love. And, and this is the other thing that, that makes me both very sad and very happy. And, and here I am definitely showing my age. But like, I got into this thing. I was seven years old. Um, I went to New York for the first time. I grew up in Israel. Uh, and we came to New York. And my parents must have uh, read one of these guidebooks of like what to do with annoying seven-year-olds in New York. And they realized it was, there was this comic book shop called the Forbidden Planet, which still exists, albeit not in the same location. Tiny, uh, tiny. All right. And, and they, took us, they took me there, and I basically just started grabbing like something like 40 or 50 comic books. And uh, I somehow conned them um, to, into buying all these things and me, saying, uh, this is a good way to learn English for school. It's very important. And so they bought these comic books, and I, I read them. But here's the thing, like, I didn't have any others for probably like three years. So these comic books were, were studied and poured over in such a deep, profound way. Today, it's astonishing how you could subscribe to comics and, or any other of these services and, and basically have access to everything ever made from, from your desk, which at, at, at one and the same time strikes me as an incredible opportunity to really be that much more sophisticated and knowledgeable about, about the art form but also in a way not to have the same kind of, um, shall I say, reverential relationship because you only have that one book that you have to make last until a month from now. Kids today, I tell you. Dorothy, you had a question? Yeah, it's me, Dorothy. So So, uh, why don't you tell me your name so next time I'll be able to say it. But but it's her computer. Um, Yeah, so my question is thinking geographically, like literally geographically and places in the world, mm-hmm. how does Dr. Doom fit into this story? Oh, say more. I love him. Well, you know, he's from, like, there's, like, as far as I remember, it's a long time since I read the early Fantastic Fours and Dr. Doom, but he, he's from this mythical, clearly Eastern European country, mm-hmm. right? And doesn't he have, like, some sort of Roma background. Is, am I misremembering that? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, first of all, he's he's from some sort of like I think uh, Mittel Europa. He's he's some sort of kind of like remnants of the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire type of thing. But it's not entirely clear where he grew up because, in fact, he is a classmate of Reed Richards. Uh, and so, whatever else his his lineage was, he did go to college. Uh, ostensibly in America or England, or it's never specified where Reed Richards went to college, uh, but but that's where they, you know, their their frenemy ship uh, and their rivalry began. Uh, and yes, he is he is all over the place, and he's not someone who, uh, to the best of my knowledge, ever makes a clear uh, allegiance with with Russian agents. There are other villains in in the in the universe uh, that are very clearly, you know, Soviet spies. Uh, the Incredible Hulk is filled with them. You know, there's so many of them. Uh, there are some cases in Spider-Man where that makes an appearance. Doctor Doom is just such an incredible... Doctor Doom is like, you know, he's like something out of the Oresteia. He's like, he's a Greek tragic figure. He is so flawed and, and amazing. There's this incredible, incredible um, book in which he devises this wonderful... Um, device that enables him to switch minds 
with with Reed Richards with Mr. Fantastic, uh, and that way kind of uh, weasel his way into the Fantastic Four and try to destroy them from the inside. And then it is incumbent upon the real Reed Richards, who's now in Doctor Doom's hideous, disfigured body, to convince his friends that it's really him, uh, which is a nice kind of you know great middle grade type of device to be excited about. But then when, when you kind of like actually look at the images of, of, of that character in that body saying these things, it's like the world's greatest psycho like psychoanalysis se session. And it, it just adds to my love of him. I really read him as a creature from like 1900s Vienna. He's a creature who like craves enlightenment and science and yet is always doomed uh, to live on the cusp of like great, just like barbaric destruction. He's a 20th century, you know, embodied. And so cool. What a cool outfit. No one else has that vibe. <laughs> uh, if there aren't any other questions, I have one more question for Liel. And I actually want to ask it for every, anybody who is brave enough uh, on this call to answer it. Um, and it's, you know, the ultimate geek question. Which superhero do you want to be? And you know which which superpower would be would be your would you want, uh, and then of course which one and I assume it's always everyone should say invisibility is the least useful uh, <laughs> um, superpower. Oh, um, I'm going to lean back in my chair and take the next four hours to deliver a very studious. Uh, but here's the thing: the superpower that I would probably want, um, I would assume is flight, uh, just as it has something so, you know, awesome, kinetic, uh, interesting, kind of embodied uh, sense about it. And it also seems to me to be the one that would get you into the least trouble. Invisibility and, and all these things uh, read to me like a complete potential for disaster. It's basically like a Seinfeld episode waiting to happen. Like you turn invisible and something says something about you and then it's awkward. Like, I don't want any of that. However, I do find myself um, kind of gravitating towards these, uh, maybe it's because of my own noble proportions, uh, but I do find myself gravitating towards these creatures that Stan Lee, but really Jack Kirby was so good at creating, you know, people like the Thing or the Hulk, uh, who, who, are these, who are these immense and, and powerful characters who are just struggling to, to sort of make sense of their, of their position in the universe because they realize the limitations of, of sort of like sheer brute force. I mean, the thing could uh, yell clobber in time and then run and punch his fists, but there comes a time inevitably uh, in every single adventure in which he just realizes that this kind of brute violent thrust is a very limited asset to have and he must stop and think. And that duality to me is always really, always really enchanting. But what do other people think? Um, good. Oh, thanks. Um, I feel like as like a five foot nothing girl, <laughs> super strength, very attractive. Um, but at the same time, I really think Emma Frost's powers are very cool. Both like because she has both the physical, like she can turn to diamond and have like invulnerable skin, and then the mental, and she can like psychologically scar you. So you know, covering a lot of bases there. So I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Other people want to answer? Oh, I'm sorry. Like another thing to Stanley's immense credit, since you since you mentioned Emma, I just um, there were virtually no women in comics. I mean, Wonder Woman, fine, the one exception that proves the rule. There were none, and if they were, they were the girl, right? They were the the thing that was falling out of windows and needed saving. Um, when he created, when Stanley created the Fantastic Four, it's like I don't want to create a woman who's just a love interest. I want to create a woman who's actually very clearly both the smartest, most powerful, and most mature member of this group. And, and Marvel continued to do it, and again, set the DNA for creators to continue to do it throughout the times, which really made comic books that much more interesting. Because, you know, why are you writing about 50% of the population or 49% of the population and, and, and making it this kind of like silly, you know, boys in tights running around? That is a tremendously important impact that, that Stanley had which we're, should be very great. We have another question. Uh, how do you differentiate between Stanley's contributions compared to his collaborators? Kind of goes back to this conversation from earlier. Im Im impossible to set them apart. Stanley, again, 
just just to answer this question, what was Stan Lee? You know, he wasn't he wasn't an artist. Uh, he wasn't even. I mean, even as if you say a writer, like he wasn't any of these things. He was really this weird creator, right? This weird party thrower, this weird host, this weird. Uh, conjurer of worlds, part of whose genius was to know to look at a person and say, you. And, and even when you, when you wonder, you know, what was in all these people, you go to, uh, to look at original Spider-Man creations and you look at um, what Steve Ditko could do just with hands, the way that he would posit the character's hands. There's more expression in, in like four, you know, early Spider-Man fingers being just at the right angle to convey so much emotion and physical discomfort or, or alienation than there is in, you know, some other serious works of, of art. And, and Stanley, you know, he not only chose these people, but also allowed them the freedom to work in a time when there was no freedom. This was considered a mass product. It was controlled by bosses who couldn't care less, who just wanted to get the next schlocky thing out. And he really let these people roam and, and do their own thing and invent their own characters and tell their own stories. Again, that, that, is, that is a sign of a truly, in the classical sense, you know, a truly liberal mind uh, who, who thrives in this ecosystem. And, and he doesn't get enough credit for that. You know, the discussion tends to be about like, oh, did he steal credit? Did he belittle other people? Well, maybe other people feel wronged and, and certainly some of them, basically mainly Jack Kirby, have a right to feel this way. But, but I think we also owe him this kind of environment that, that made so much great artistic deliberation, you know, possible and welcome. Maybe that's the superpower I would like, you know? <laughs> All right, did anyone else want to answer the superhero power? Some people have, have typed it in, but it's not the same when you just type it into the chat. So unmute yourself and tell us your superpower as we get ready to say goodbye. Um, I would like to fly because like flying is cool, but I want wings. I don't just want to like fly in like a unicorn. <laughs> kind of weird. Also, I think the least useful is walking through walls because like chances are there's a door because someone <laughs> put you in there. So like there's a door and if you're super right. strong and you can fly, you just like smash through the glass window because they right. do that in books all the time. So right. clearly it's possible. You do not need to be able to walk through walls. All right, Mark? But no, I was just going to say, ironically, probably one of the first Jewish superheroes, her power was walking through walls. Mm -hmm. um, but I would want to have Jean Grey, speaking of powerful women, I would want to have Jean Grey's powers uh, of uh, telekinesis and telepathy. Other folks brave enough to answer? I'd want to be Storm to be able to control the weather. Which, according to anti-Semites, is something that all Jews already do, so. <laughs> Someone else has got to answer, because we can't stop on that. Um, I would say that, that I actually think the speed. I'm, my kids are into the Arrowverse, so we watch a lot of The Flash. And I think that the speed and the capacity to move through things, in, I understand it's not as a soul power not so helpful, but I, it, it does seem that they have figured out a way to give him every power there is yeah. uh, just through speed. So I do that. All right, if there aren't other comments or questions, uh, I wanna, you know, it's been about an hour and a half. I wanna thank Liel for taking the time today, uh, this evening to be with us. Um, this has been fun. Um, it's fun, we, we, we have been talking about, oh, we should get together and talk comic books and podcasts and, for three years since our kids started going to, you know, being in class together and we and haven't it, done it. And it now only took a plague to do it. <laughs> Guys, thank you so, Darren, thank you so much. And, and thank you all. Um, I, 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 I miss you. I look forward to the time when we could all be together again uh, for Minyan and Shabbos and, and other occasions. And this has been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you. That's going to get me far. <laughs> you can do it now. There's a whole discipline. <laughs> Email me about this. I'm serious. Okay. Well, let's really have serious. another one of these about video games. I would love that. Mm -hmm. But that one would have to be three hours long because there's no way I'm <laughs> spending that into an hour and a half. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>